Thank you for, uh, for coming to this beta zone with Richard Baldwin, who is Professor of International and Development Studies in Switzerland. And R Professor Baldwin is here to speak to us about the future of future globalization and really how robotics and globalization can come together and provide a future of work for a vision of future of work for us all. So without any other delay, I will invite Richard Baldwin to the stage. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Do me a favor. Close your eyes and imagine what globalization's like. No, really. Close your eyes and bring up into your mind a photograph or a sound of globalization. What does it sound like? OK, you can open your eyes now. How many of you saw something like this? Globalization sounds like trucks, planes, trains, automobiles. How many of you thought something else? Today, I'd like to change that image of globalization in your mind. Indeed, I would like to change the way you think about globalization. Because you see, I think future globalization will be very different than the globalization we've known in the past and the globalization we know now. And I think people aren't ready for it yet. You see, future globalization will be about things that we do, not just things that we make. Now, I know that sentence sounds very abstract now, but over the next 12 minutes, we're going to take a walk down a path of logic and facts. And I hope at the end of that journey, that sentence makes perfect sense. And I hope that sentence helps you understand why future globalization will be very different. And also, why you should be a little more nervous and a little more excited about future globalization. So should we get started? Yes. All right. Should we do that one more time? We'll do it. You really did this. Should we get started? Yes. All right. There we go. OK. Now, let's start the journey by getting back to that image, the images in your mind. What did all those images have in common? Well, they were about goods, things that we make. And that was for a very simple reason. It has to do with the fundamental nature of globalization. Globalization, you see, is rather easy. Arbitrage drives globalization. Now let me explain, without talking about globalization, just for a minute, what I mean by arbitrage in this context. When people go to Germany, they try the beer, because the beer in Germany is rather good. And when they go to France, they try the wine, because the wine's rather good. Now the point here is that some countries are especially good at making some things and less good at making it others. Arbitrage is driven by companies exploiting those differences. They make things in countries that are especially good at them, and they sell them elsewhere. Now, a critical element of that selling elsewhere is that they're goods, for the very simple reason that it's much easier to ship across borders the things that we make than it is the things that we do. But ask yourself, why is that? Why is shipping things that we make easy while shipping things that we do is harder? Now, the reason has to do with the fundamental nature of services. For most services, you have to get the service provider and the service buyer in the same room at the same time. And the technical difficulties of getting buyers from one nation in the room with suppliers of another nation is why globalization up to now has been mostly in goods, not services. But here's the thing. Digital technology is changing that reality. Digital technology 
is making it easier to ship across borders the things we do. And that will change globalization. Now, <clears throat> before I explain how digital technology is going to make that possible, I want to argue that it will be profitable. Bear with me for a second. Imagine a Star Trek world where workers could cautiously teleport from one country into offices in another country and then back, cautiously, instantly. The economic question is, would they have an incentive to do so? What do you think? Yes. All you have to do is look at the enormous salary differences across the world, and you realize if we could arbitrage them, we would. Now, we don't live in a Star Trek world, but we live in a world where a US accountant earns five times what a Polish accountant does. If it were a Star Trek world, Polish accountants would teleport into New York City accounting offices in the morning, work all day long, and teleport back to Warsaw in the evening. And in doing so, they would have a much better job, and the New York accounting firm would save a whole lot of money. This is what I'd like to call telemigration. People sitting in one nation, working in offices in another nation. And that's what I'd like to convince you will be a very substantial part of the future of globalization. Now, that's the first realization in our journey. Telemigration would be really profitable if it were technically feasible. The second bit of the talk is to convince you that it's becoming technically feasible. I'm going to focus on just four things. The first one is domestic telecommuting goes global. Now, in the US and in Europe and many other countries, people telecommute to work, say, half day a week or a day a week. How many of you have telecommuted to your own job in the last month? OK, not so many. The point, though, is that domestic telecommuting is preparing us and our companies and the nature of the services for slotting remote workers into the workflow. Companies are adopting collaborative software, like Slack or Project Manage. They're investing in telecommunication facilities that make remote workers much less remote. And we are arranging our labor markets and our way of living to deal with working remotely. Now, up till now, most of that has been domestic, often within the same city. But once our companies have rearranged things to make it easy to slot in remote workers, they will figure out that they could be slotting in foreign workers for one-tenth of the price of the domestic telecommuters. Not for everything, but for some tasks. The second is online freelancing platforms enable telemigration. So if you haven't seen these things, freelance is the largest one. How many of you have heard of freelance? There's a Chinese one called Whitmart in English. It's called, I think, Zubaiji in, in Chinese. But there's Freelancer, there's Mechanical Turk. There's actually a competition going on in these platforms. Now what these are is like eBay or Alibaba for services. eBay became powerfully important because it matched people who had goods to sell with people who wanted to buy it. They managed the shipping and the payment in a way that made everybody happy. Upwork is doing that for international freelancing right now. They have millions of freelancers registered in over 100 countries. And last year, they processed over a billion dollars of freelancing revenue. They are supposed to go public this year. We'll see what happens. These are, in essence, the container ships of telemigration. These are the conduits by which the service providers and the service buyers will connect with each other and make sure everything works and gets paid. 
The third one is machine translation will break down language barriers. Now, actually, this whole session was supposed to be done real live machine translation, so you would be hearing me speak in Mandarin, or those of you who speak Mandarin were hearing me speak in English. No, 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 no just the Mandarin way. Um, but unfortunately, the t digital technology wasn't strong enough, the Wi-Fi here. And I think that's almost a poem. This isn't quite there. But if you haven't tried it, you really must try it. It's completely different. And the reason of this revolution was that in 2006, the UN put on millions of hand-translated sentences into the six official languages of the UN. And the Googles and the Amazons and the Microsofts of this world threw it into their big machine learning things. And machine translation got incredibly good, incredibly fast. And it's available right now for free on your iPhone, your iPad, and your tablets, your laptops. You should try it. I mean, not right now. I'm talking. But you, know, you should try it very soon. Um, in fact, I'm going to try and use it when I try and take a train from here to Beijing. We'll see how it works. But think about how revolutionary that is. All of you are international people. Think about how many things are disturbed by the language barrier. And think about a world where that language barrier today is only half of what it was yesterday. And in two years, it'll be half of what it is today, and, and, et cetera. It's almost as if trade and services faced a barrier of, let's just make this up, a 1,000% tariff. And machine translation brought it down to 500%. And next year, it'll be 250%, et cetera, et cetera. At a very fast pace, we will see a talent tsunami. Hundreds of millions of talented, low-cost workers in emerging markets who have up till now been excluded from international freelancing because of language barriers will be speaking good enough English, or French, or Spanish, or whatever language you want. All of a sudden, special people in the world will feel a lot less special because they'll be in competition with people who couldn't possibly have competed with them before. The last is telepresence redefines face-to-face. -face. And I'm using telepresence as a catch-all for all the advanced telecommunications that all of you know, FaceTime, Skype, whatever. People are less remote than they were before because of telecommunication getting so good so fast. These, which are used in uh, accounting firms and banks and some governments, essentially they have life-size screens and high-resolution cameras. And people who use these soon feel it's almost as if they're in the same room. And that allows a degree of cooperation uh, and progress in meetings that wasn't possible on Skype or phone or whatever. It's all kind of a, a psychological trick of, of the, why face-to-face -face is important. These things right now are clumsy and expensive. But the way manufacturing goes and the processing goes, I bet you in five years it'll be on our iPhone. And it'll involve holograms, or artificial reality, or, or virtual reality. There's a whole bunch of them going on. Basically, it makes remote workers less remote. It will make it easy for people sitting in the Philippines to provide services in Japan, or Mexico, in New York, or Argentina, That was the first two stages of our journey. Telemigration would be incredibly profitable if it were possible. Digital technology is making it possible. The question is, how fast is telemigration coming? The answer, in my mind, is faster than most believe because of the pace of digital technology. Now, perhaps a World Economic Forum audience is not the audience who's most naive about the progress of digital technology. But still, I find it very difficult to get this point across to audiences. So today, I'm going to try something different. Instead of talking about Moore's Law, I'm going to take an example. This is an iPhone 6S. Actually, it's not, because I forgot my 6S at home. And uh, so we're going to have to pretend this is a 6S. 
Can we do that? OK, virtual space, imagination. All right, so this is an iPhone 6S, which I bought in 2015. And it's a very powerful computer. It's more powerful than the computer that guided Apollo 11 to the moon and back in 1969. Do you know how much more powerful? Just stop me when I get there. A hundred times more powerful, a thousand times more powerful, a million times more powerful. The answer is it's 120 million times more powerful. Actually, it's a clicker, so it's not very powerful at all. But the iPhone 6S is 120 million times faster than the computer that guided Apollo 11. Now, this really is an iPhone 10, which I bought in 2017. And it is two and a half times faster in terms of processing speed than the 6S. That's amazing. What that means is that there was more progress between 2015 and 2017 than there was between 1969 and 2015. And that's why things which were plausible but difficult in 2016 are ubiquitous this year, and amazing things will happen. That's why it's happening faster than you can believe. People think about telemigration and think it's something for the future, but it, it is not. It has already happened in web development, for example. Teams work together virtually in web development. OK. So that was my graphic for, I'll skip that part. Now, we've had three stages on this journey. Telemigration will be profitable if it's possible. Tele digital technology is making it possible. And it's coming faster than most people believe. So let's get back to this sentence. Future globalization will be about things we do, not just things that we make. I hope this journey has changed the image of globalization in your mind. And I hope along the way, it's raised your level of anxiety a little bit, this competition with low cost, talented foreigners sitting abroad. But it should also have made you a little more excited about future globalization for the very simple reason that globalization always means more opportunities for a nation's most competitive citizens and firms, but more competition for its least competitive citizens and firms. And I look out here, and I see a whole audience full of highly competitive people for whom Telemigration will allow you to sell your services to a wider market and therefore raise the value of the skills that you have. But think about those people who will be displaced. Let's not forget them. I think telemigration will be as disruptive to office workers in advanced countries as past globalizations were to factory workers in advanced countries. And I think they will be angry about it. That's the second word in my new book, Globotics Upheaval. That's why I think we should all be a little more nervous about globalization, but also a little more excited. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have about 15 minutes for a Q&A, which I'm going to moderate myself. Um, I'm a prof college professor, so I can do this sort of stuff. Um, now, I also understand, I've, I've moderated a few sessions already, and nobody asked the first question. So does anybody have the second question? <laughs> or I can get one of the, oh, here we go, please. It's very exciting, but what happens about the people who lose their jobs? What's going to be for them, you know? Right. So um, I'm worried about that, very worried about that. I think it will be very disruptive in the rich countries. Now, mind you, it's an export opportunity in the emerging markets. And it's one that's not tied to manufacturing or commodities. So I think it will be a continuation of the emerging market miracles for emerging countries. But in the rich countries, there's a whole bunch of people who were insulated from competition from foreigners because of the high face-to-face -face costs, and they were insulated from automation because computers couldn't think. And digital technology is changing those realities quickly. 
So what I think is going to have to do is, first of all, I anticipated this question, actually. I didn't plant it. We have to prepare for the challenges. People will have to change jobs. And the companies who, are, who can take advantage of this will be very profitable. Those who don't will be displaced and disrupted. Second, we have to embrace the opportunities. This is not just bad news. Globalization always means more opportunities and more competition. And we have to embrace the opportunities, helping people move into it. In particular, in emerging markets, I think governments ought to help by setting up platforms like freelance, but local ones that they control. And lastly, if it goes too fast, I think we'll have to slow it down. The good news is rich country governments have all the tools they need to slow it down. It's called employment protection legislation. It makes it very hard to fire people. And all they have to do is dial that up and it will slow down the process. It's not a beautiful thing, but it may be better than the kind of backlash that will happen if tens or hundreds of millions of people lose their job in the next few years. So thank you for that question. I probably didn't answer it, but at least I talked for a little while. Is that OK? Thank you. Please. So uh, I'm from Singapore. It's an island. It's very prosperous. And I'm a village chief in Samoa, which is another island which nobody visits, <laughs> somewhere in, near New Zealand. I want Samoa to do the same thing that Singapore can do through telecommuting. Can we do this exercise, for example, what can I do as a village chief in Samoa to create jobs that or to bring or to increase the population of 170,000 people in this country to like 17 million people because everybody can work there now or that they can work elsewhere. Just as an exercise, what can we do? Sure. So I don't have the answers. The book I'm, is coming out in February 2019. By the way, did I advertise my book yet? No. Anyways, it's coming out. It's pre-order on Amazon. Um, I don't look at this from a developing country's perspective because I'm really worried about upheaval in the rich countries. But let's think it through together. I don't have any of the answers. Basically, you have to help people get online to export services. I was in Argentina a couple weeks ago talking about the same thing. And there's a few problems of getting online. One is accreditation. So what does it mean to be Samoan and be able to have a book counting certificate? Who knows what that means? But the government could help establish equivalencies to international bookkeeping things and therefore help people get online. The second thing is you could potentially ensure that taxes are paid and labor market rules are respected. Because I think very soon we will find a backlash against freelancers who are not paying taxes and who are not respecting labor laws. I think there'll be a backlash. And so if you get ahead of that and you're the quality, you're the Singapore, Singapore is not cheap, they're just good. You could get ahead of that. But those are the ones that occurred to me. So please, back there. There's, there was a, the woman back there, please. Hi, I'm Elaine from the Bay Area in the tech field. So for me, it's very hard to envision a world that will be uh, upheaval, you know, for the de uh, developed country. Because um, I have a hard time to hire enough software engineers. I wonder what's your point of when you have these opportunities for telecommuting, it basically drains all the talents from developing countries. I mean, look at US, both coasts already drain all the talents from the middle. So it's very hard, it's a different point of view. What do you think about that? You know? Right. So uh, actually, the software development and web development is actually where this has already happened a lot, and it's globalized. But just imagine if all the Indian programmers and all the Chinese programmers and all the Indian, uh, they could all speak good enough English. All of a sudden, your supply will increase. So I think the reason it's tight is it's a fast growing market. They're relatively limited, and you can only hire people who speak good enough English. So I think it will expand. Uh, the other is, I do think that's another issue in emerging markets. I, I was talking with an entrepreneur from Sri Lanka uh, this summer. And he, he was a, a tech guy trying to do the last mile for Amazon. And he said none of his Sri Lankan friends work in the local economy. 
they all work on Upwork because the pay is better and it's sure. And they can diversify with different projects. So I do think there may be a disconnect between some of the talented people in the local economies, which will have implications for emerging markets. But for those workers, it's good jobs. I mean, I think it's not that unlike call centers in India, which it began very small and was limited by things. But then when it became a good thing, people started training to become call center people. And so the, the supply expanded. And it didn't really disrupt the Indian economy too much. That's my guess. But again, I haven't done research on it. Please. Next. Hi, I'm Marco from Milan, Italy. I enjoy your speech. And uh, you made me think about my country when we were global 2,000 years ago, Rome. <laughs> then uh, Venice. And everybody was, spoke your language, too. Yeah. <laughs> Venice in, in the 15th century, and uh, even Florence, Renaissance. General. Now we are in an opposite situation, and my thought is that I don't think the majority of the people in the world, not only in Italy, in Italy total, but in the world, don't want to be globalized. So uh, how can we merge your, your ideas with the willingness to be globalized? I want, but not all the majority. So they refused all these technologies. How can we bring them to the, on board? Sure, sure. So thank that you. is something I've actually thought about, and thank you for asking that question. So I'll give you another spiel about that. And it's what I call the iPhone infiltration. So let me talk about something else for a second. Have you been at meetings or family dinners where everybody's looking at their iPhone, their smartphone, instead of talking to each other? How could you get back home if you didn't have your iPhone? We have come to rely on smartphones, and it's changed our relationship with people in the rest of the world. But here's the thing. Nobody decided to make that happen. It just happened. Seven years ago, the iPhone was a good music player, a bad phone with a short battery life, and a web browser that wasn't much good because there was no Wi-Fi. Now, it's everything for us. But we never decided to do that. One cost savings at a time, one convenience at a time, we allowed the iPhone to infiltrate and completely change our lives. And that's how telemigration will come in. It will be one task, one job in one company at a time, completely unrelated, and everybody, while it's going on, will probably think it's a good thing. They won't even notice it's happening. But we'll look back in five years and go, how did we ever get along without foreign freelancers? Just like the web development uh, company. You could not do your job without online. I'm, I'm guessing you could not do your job without online. That's how this will come. Nobody will ask us. There will be no government policy because there are no borders. The, GATT, the WTO rules already underpin this type of trade. And the internet is not really controllable. So nobody will be asked. It will happen. That's my take. Please. Thanks. Um, hi, uh, I'm Bibi. I'm a global shaper from Guatemala. And I was mind blown by everything that you were saying. Um, I have two questions. The first is very, very simple. Um, you said to us, close your eyes and think of the sound that globalization is making. For me, it was like, shh. So first question, what is the sound that this other globalization is doing? And then um, the second is you are talking about services. And we are the ones who provide services. We are the ones who are prepared uh, and skilled to do it. Um, so what you were saying is I think you are, for example, if one person is skilled here, you're putting the other one with the skills there um, with, a, with the translation, for example. So what will happen for the translators, for example, that are translating right now? Um, so is it to be more equal, uh, to, a, to a more equal society with this future globalization? And should we reskill, or what would be our advantage if you want to see it like that? Right. Um, so the sound is tough. Actually, I wanted them to get a graphic uh, for what it sounds like at the end, and we couldn't figure out one. So. Uh, there are offices, like in web development, where people are on screens and they're kind of networking with each other online all day long, doing different projects. But that doesn't sound, and, couldn't, and there's telepresence robots. Anyways, 
The second one is, uh, I think it's difficult. Uh, I'm very optimistic in the long run that artificial intelligence and this remote intelligence will make us have a better world. Think about the jobs that will be left. These globots, as I call them, we cannot compete with them. AI is almost free on the margin, and these remote workers are quite cheap on the margin. So we will do what the globots can't. And what that means is the tasks of the future jobs will involve face-to-face -face interaction where you actually have to be in the room with somebody else. And it will involve very human talents because AI, at least up to now, can't deal with human things like empathy and creativity and responsibility, managing large groups of teams. One-on-one, -on -one they're okay, but large teams they can't do. So the future jobs will be more local, more human, and we'll all be richer. So that's much better and probably more equal. We'll get, take the robot out of all of our jobs. The trouble is how to get there. That's the upheaval part. Because job displacement is being driven at the speed of digital technology. That's the business model. All these AI geniuses are coming up with ways to replace workers. 10% of the nurses, 10% of the book accountants. That's how they're going to get rich. That's the business model. The job creation, which will come, is driven at the pace of human ingenuity and entrepreneurship, which is not explosive. So in the short run, there will be a disconnect between the job displacement and the job replacement, even though in the long run, just like it happened with the Industrial Revolution and the transition from farms to factories and factories to services, hugely disruptive, we did find jobs, but I suspect that's the problem in the meantime, and it could very well get more unequal because a lot of these service sector jobs are protecting people who aren't competitively international, internationally. And I think, so I, in the rich countries, I think it will be disruptive. In the Guatemala, I think it will be big export opportunities, and I think it will be very, very good. So we are out of time then. Sorry about that. But they've just put, put up this slide, which means I have to stop. So thank you very much. You've been a great audience.